everyone so ocular trauma is a uh, is quite an important topic especially for the post graduates so most ophthalmologists will encounter patients with trauma in daily opd many may range from a small corneal foreign body to a ruptured globe a vision 66 to maybe npl and some conditions may be sight threatening and require urgent treatment and given patients uh, expectations may go unrealistic because of the high surgical cost and unpredictable outcomes and also there are a lot of medical legal problems so we'll cover a lot of topics which are very important for managing a patient with trauma so it gives me immense pleasure to introduce my teachers to you uh, dr manranjan das he is the head in the cornea department in arvin a high volume surgeon with more than 20 years of experience dr madhu shekar he is the head in the cataract and iul department a high volume surgeon with more than 10 years of surgical experience dr vijay lakshmi senior consultant in the department of glaucoma myself dr piyush kohli dr mahesh kumar head neuro ophthalmology and dr naresh babu he uh, is a head in the retina department recipient of the red pocklar award with more than 100 publications and more than 20 years of experience so i invite uh manojan das sir to start his good morning one and all uh, this is uh, a esteem happiness for me to be the part of this uh, ic and this is the most common and uh, sort of a topic which uh, everyone uh, is interested to know so the uh, going to the next slide the main uh, main goals of the corneal scleral injuries uh, is to prevent further injuries into the eye before the surgery starts to try using the patient and taking care of the uh, various other injuries which is associated in the uh, multiple uh, in multiple skeletal system injury will be might be there and you need to expedited the pre uh, operative evaluation and anesthetic clearance is needed if at all um, you go for uh, any um, anesthesia problem so basically we need to have uh, to obtain the infection control port protocol has to be meticulously followed we have to give uh, administer the systemic antibiotics as well as tetanus prophylaxis if needed documentation of all medical records uh, is meticulously to be done the type of injury mode of injury time of injury who brought the patient uh, how many uh, any previous treatment before addressing to coming to us and all these are of a lot of medical legal importance uh, and it has to be uh, recorded and uh, meticulously and has to be then uh, that should be a comprehensive and honest discussion about the surgical outcome or the intervention whatever you are planning to the patient if he is beyond 18 years and along with the family members so as you know that the commonly the bunningham eye trauma terminology has been well established uh, classification of injury so according to this uh, you come across the closed globe injury or open globe injury closed globe injury is a injury where this ocular tunics or the uh, are not involved uh, so it can be only contusion or uh, lamellar lacerations open globe again classified uh, into globe rupture and laceration where the ocular tunics are ruptured so laceration goes for penetrating injury with a single uh, entry wound and then perforating injury at the entry and exit wound and intraocular foreign body retained in the wound or inside the eye so now once you classify the injury then you have to grade the injury grade 1 grade 2 grade 3 grade 1 limits the limbus grade 2 uh, which is a 5 mm beyond the limbus and and the grade 3 is uh, beyond uh, 5 mm into the sclera so grade 2 and grade 3 has got lesser prognosis or bad prognosis than the grade 1 so once you get the grade and uh, dunning then you have to have a ocular stoma society score and according to this score there are various uh, points uh, uh, starting from visual acuity estimation to the type of uh, in, uh, type of or grade of trauma uh, uh, that the patient has sustained and each um, for each thing it has been assigned a number like if it is npl it is 60 points so you have to add on this raw points like if suppose you get 60 npl no perception of light and then you got a end of thalmitis or growth rupture then 60 plus 23 it is minus 47 
So what happens with this? The score comes to like this: zero to forty-five, forty-five to sixty, and so on, ninety. So here, once the score is that, then you get a score of one to five. One being the uh, poorest prognosis, and five being the good prognosis. So this is the prognostic indicator for the patient and for the uh, their attenders. So the battery of investigations are there. X-ray, CT orbit uh, has to be done uh, as a matter of. Um, routine procedure ultrasonography is highly needed and the investigation uh, pertaining to the general anesthesia clearance has to also be obtained so plain radiograph shows the interocular or interorbital for radiopic foreign body and also orbital fractures and it also a major uh, medical legal uh, documentation ultrasonography is assesses the uh, radiolucent and radiopic foreign body along with the posterior segment abnormalities computer entered city also helps us and in open globe injury where there is no contact and also safe in metallic foreign bodies and no uh, contrast needed in these cases however the radiation exposure is the major uh, um, disadvantage of this procedure so preoperatively before going for surgery the assessment is very important we need to pad and bandage uh, the eye after applying the topical antibiotics excessive use of topical uh, antibiotics should not be used in a open globe injury so then coming to the surgery per se so surgery per se starts with the holding of the needle and the needle with the needle holder so ideal uh, needle holding should be at the anterior junction of anterior 2/3 and posterior 1/3 uh, position and after this what is the aim of the suturing suturing has to have a watertight wound closure restoration of anatomical relationship uh, restoration of the optic my visual function and also prevention of future complications like in secondary glaucoma or endophthalmitis so this is the major way of doing it for suturing in the cornea so rose way his technique of suturing has to be uh, done because it is uh, maintains the prolate shape of the uh, cornea in which uh, the smaller sutures are put at the center visual axis area where the uh, cornea uh, is uh, made a um, uh, little bit flatter and the peripheral long sutures will make the uh, cornea stiffer so that the cornea maintains its normal shape of prolate next is the visual axis involving in lacerations this are again we have to use a no uh, no touch technique or minimal technique handling and tissues uh, visual axis should be spared so if at all possible you need to go for a finer sutures so this is a video you can see the video i this is a child with the injury of the scale steel scale and with a anterior subluxation cataract so in this case what i am doing is that uh, once it is the side port i need to stain the lens Uh, because it enters out, I didn't remove it as such uh, with the whole capsule bag. Usually, sometimes we tend to remove it whole capsule bag. Then vitreous will come. Uh, then you have to do vitreotomy. I didn't do all this. I done a minor modification for that. I just ruptured the anterior capsule after staining it, uh, and then I uh, hydrated the uh, lens, which is always uh, like glue. So it comes out. Once you remove the uh, this thing, I just left it like that uh, so that. Uh, that uh, remnants of the lens, anterior lens capsule and posterior lens capsule, uh, can be used for secondary oil fixation. So coming to the next, the two limbs of the if you get a triangular step injury, you have to consider the two limbs of the triangle as separate linear lines and sutures like this. So if you get a zigzag lacerations like that, that uh, you have to have the following anatomical landmarks, which helps to maintain its integrity and the prolate shape. So major uh, landmark is limbus. Next is the pigment line in the cornea. So third is the uh, sharp angles at the laceration edges, and the fourth is the stellate edges. So corneal sclerosis, and first we need to re-approximate at the limbus, uh, and then scleral lone has to be sutured with nino, and corneal lone uh, has to be sutured with tenolinon. So scleral suturing has been done uh, as a technique of uh, close as you go. That means you expose the uh, corne uh, the sclerocorneal junction and put suture uh, starting at the um, limbus. This is one more case where you can see the uveal exposure uh, and also. 
the uveal prolapse. In this case, traumatic cataract is there and in an adult patient with uh, devitalized uh, cornea iris tissue. So in this case, one it is presentation is more than 48 hours, you always go for the uh, excision of the uveal tissue. If it is less than 48 hours without any wound infiltrate or any uh, trauma uh, injury to the uh, this iris, and then you can always repose it back. Here we did it. Once you suture, and then you do a traumatic cataract. Always secondary IVL is better than primary IVL. You will avoid a lot of uh, intraoperative complications. You do a SICS tunnel and deliver the nucleus. So next is the, as I told you, you have to suture as you go down. So once you put a suture at the limbus and the sclera, and then you repose this uh, uveal tissue which is prolapsed back into the uh, eye and then uh, you keep suturing it. So post-operative management goals mainly is to prevent infection uh, and uh, suppression of inflammation by using of steroid, control of IOP and relieving of pain. So post-operative management can be given starts with the oral and intravenous antibiotics, steroid and cyclopatic drops and frequent uh, examination of posterior segment is highly important in all cases of open group injury because they are predisposed to retinal detachment uh, um, uh, always. So traumatic post-traumatic -tra endophthalmitis, uh, 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 and there is a publication which is well accepted. They say that a prophylactic intravitreal uh, administration of antibiotic in high-risk cases is mandatory in a open glow injury. So how is the, who are the uh, uh, high-risk cases? Dirty wound, retained into a foreign body, delayed presentations, rural setting, breach of anterior capsule. These are all expo uh, 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 scenarios which cause the bridge uh, early traumatic endophthalmitis. So um, this is the continuation of that. So when do you remove the sutures? You remove the sutures ideally at, at three months or whenever they are loose before three months. Sequence and lumbar of tight sutures are removed first and refractive corrections or spectacles or contactless can be given after one month of suture removal. Follow-up is uh, uh, counseling is very important. Prevention of similar situation and trauma has to be uh, explained and protection should be done, has to be done. Thank you for your kind attention. I think the point that sir has made is, uh, apart from treating the patient, we have to document everything, explain the prognosis, and be ready with the documents for medical legal thing. Thank you. Yeah, so thank next, you. I think Dr. Madhu sir will be presenting on cataracts, lens and subluxation. Uh, good uh, good morning, everyone, and uh, thank you, AIS, and uh, thank you, Pius, for giving me opportunity. I'm going to present on uh, traumatic uh, cataract and lens subluxation management of uh, with management with hood rings and hooks. And uh, uh, my presentation is a video based presentation that sometimes uh, uh, I have no financial interest to disclose. And uh, ocular trauma is uh, known to be associated with cataract changes in the lens. And cataract surgery in traumatized eyes is the most difficult situation commonly encountered. And surgeon must prepare for any expected and un unexpected situation to give best visual outcome. Uh, like uh, in sleep lamp ev evolution, like obvious sign of subluxation like phacodonosis, vitreous in anterior chamber, lens subluxation, and iododonosis is less likely to miss. But a uh, subtle sign of uh, subluxation, like uh, visibility of lens equator uh, in eccentric gaze, iodolentricular gap, gap, focal iodonosis, this should be looked for. Sometimes uh, these subtle signs of subluxation uh, may be missed during pre-op workup. So when you uh, start your rexis and puncture with uh, sharp cystitome and you give, get this dimple sign in the anterior lens capsule, you can anticipate uh, gross subluxation in this type and you have to prepare to manage this type of cases accordingly. Sometimes uh, like uh, if you have started rexis and you are finding it difficult to raise the flap or initiate the rexis then you can in anticipate some degree of subluxation and you have to uh, plan your surgery accordingly and uh, you can manage it accordingly. Uh, 
like uh, just after coronal entry, if you encounter with vit vitreous, this is most difficult situation for surgeon to manage this type of cases. Mostly we are uh, making primary incision away from the area of dialysis to avoid vitreous prolapse. But if you get uh, vitreous in, uh, during primary entry, then you have to first manage the vitreous. You have to uh, reposit the vitreous back and then you have to tamponade the uh, dialyzed area with uh, dispersive or high viscosity viscoelastic then you have to do automated vitrectomy before starting your surgery to uh, clear all the vitreous. And for rexis, rexis we have to, uh, in this type of subluxated cataract, better to start in the area of intact zonules first and larger in the area away from the area of subluxation. So that when you place CTR or uh, IOL, uh, then uh, this uh, rexis will become centric. So you have to slightly uh, make it eccentric and uh, due to loss of zonules, there will always tendency to run away in that area. Placement of hooks uh, is important in managing this type of cases. Uh, every three to four o'clock hour of dialysis should be uh, supported with hooks uh, before starting surgery. And, uh, care should, and you can make your paracentesis slightly behind your limbus so that when you pull your uh, hooks so that it will uh, keep your bag horizontal. And uh, while, uh, and, uh, while uh, this uh, uh, pulling this uh, capsule hooks, you have to be careful. Don't uh, give extra stress on the anterior lens capsule. Otherwise, it will tear off. CTR placement, uh, it depends on the uh, degree of general dialysis. You can place it either before nucleus management or after nucleus management. So uh, only thing, you, you can postpone your CTR uh, placement as much as possible because it uh, cortex may get entrapped between your CTR and bag and cortex aspiration will be difficult. Cortex wash, you have to do it in a tangential manner in this type of cases, otherwise it can cause further general damage. To avoid that, you have to uh, pull the cortex in the tangential manner. And uh, Coming to the IOL placement, better to prefer three-piece uh, uh, IOL uh, and uh, uh, in sulcus placement with reverse optic capture, it will give you long-term stability of IOL and uh, it can prevent uh, uh, late post-op IOL bag uh, dislocation. So in this case, I am uh, repl uh, replacing the hooks from capsular bag to iris and then you can place your only care should be taken that uh, your haptic should go in the correct uh, uh, direction and orientation and then you can dial it and then you can uh, capture it in the bag. And the follow-up is very important to uh, rule out any secondary glaucoma or uh, post-op uveitis. And uh, early capsular phimosis is most, more common in these cases because of uh, uh, lax zonules. And we have to follow it for late follow-up also is important to uh, look for late uh, IOL bag uh, disintegration. So these are very important. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, sir. I think that was a nice presentation with all the videos, how to manage. Next, I'll invite Dr. Vijay Lakshmi to highlight us the management of traumatic glaucoma.
so good morning everyone today i'll be discussing on management of traumatic glaucoma so as you all know traumatic glaucoma is a major cause of blindness so before one start treating a patient with traumatic glaucoma they have to clearly understand what is the predisposing factor for this rise in intraocular pressure only then the right treatment option can be chosen so this traumatic glaucoma can happen following blunt injury or lacerating injury or chemical exposure or radiation and also it has a varied presentation it can happen within days to weeks or several years after injury and here the iop elevation it can manifest as an acute reversible transient condition or it can manifest as a chronic irreversible open angle glaucoma or angle closure glaucoma stage Shihota et al. He did a detailed analysis of what are the predictive factors for developing glaucoma in patients with closed lobe injury, and his observations are advancing age, lens injury, high intraocular pressure, high fema, increased trabecular mesure, pigmentation of more than or equal to grade three, and angle recession of more than 180 degrees. Now comes the most challenging part, like how we record intraocular pressure in patients with distorted corneas. This happens especially in patients with penetrating or perforating injury, and also in patients with severe chemical injury, where the cornea is going to be really scarred, edematous, and traumatized. Here, recording intraocular pressure with Goldman ablation tonometry is not going to be that much accurate, since the corneal contact surface area is more than 3.06 mm. So we need to choose alternative methods of tonometry like ribbon tonometry, transpalpable tonometer, digital tonometer, or toner pen. Here, the advantage of using toner pen is that the corneal contact surface area is only about one mm. So, accuracy of recording intraocular pressure is going to be relatively a little bit greater when compared to Goldman ablation tonometry. So, few patients immediately after injury who are predisposed to develop glaucoma in future, they can manifest with very low intraocular pressure. So, this could be due to either severe inflammation in the anterior chamber or due to a formation of the cyclodialysis cleft. So this is a communication between the anterior chamber and the suprachoroidal space. Eventually, these patients may end up with increase in intraocular pressure once the inflammation is controlled or with the closure of the cyclodialysis cleft. So regarding mechanism of injury, so with the interest of time, I'll be discussing about three major types of injury, closed lobe, open lobe, and chemical injury. So if we uh, think of closed lobe injury, here, the increase in intraocular pressure is going to be relatively greater and also it much develops much earlier. And it is a medically refractive condition where the patient needs multiple surgical interventions to control the intraocular pressure. Here, the possible mechanisms are angle recession, high fema, pigment dispersion, and lens injury. When we take uh, this open globe injury, when compared to closed lobe, here there are less chances of trabecular mesure damage and lens injury. And here the possible mechanisms are inflammation, oppositional cynical angle closure, gosal glaucoma, and lens-related mechanisms. When we take this chemical injury, here the alkali injuries are more common hazardous than acidic injury. And here the possible mechanisms are collagen shrinkage and contraction and pupillary block and damage to trabecular meshwork and collector channels. So now com coming to management of traumatic glaucoma. So this includes a broad spectrum of management. It can be as simple as just eliminating the underlying cause, or it can be a challenging one where the patient may need a lot of multiple surgical interventions to control the intraocular pressure. So the treatment options available are medical management, laser peripheral iridotomy, cataract extraction, AC wash, and invasive glaucoma filtration surgeries like trabeculectomy and GDD, and non-invasive cyclodestructive procedures like micropulse and diode. So regarding medical management, several studies have clearly stated there is a good outcomes with medical management alone in more than 50 to 80 percentage of patients. And few patients, they may need a supportive treatment with steroids and cyclophysics also. And as such, PG analogs, there is no any absolute contraindication in prescribing in some patients except for severe inflammation. Regarding trabeculectomy with antifibrotics, so as you all know, trauma and angle recession, they are independent risk factors for blood fibrosis and blood failure. So we need to consider using high dose of MMC in such patients. But we have to remember that there is a long-term risk of blood-related infection in these patients. And relative contraindication or 
chemical injury and scarred conjunctiva. Regarding GDD, if the patient is having severe inflammation, angle recession, trauma induced aphakia or pseudophakia, then they are prone to develop early blood fibrosis. So in such patients, we preferably choose RD with supramid stenting or AGV depending upon the severity of glaucoma. And in patients with a, a very good visual prognosis, when the intraocular pressure is going to be really high, who are uh, predisposed to develop a lot of choroidal complications with invasive glaucoma filtering surgeries, then may, we may preferably do a micropulse. If the patient visual prognosis is going to be poor, then we prefer doing a diode CPC. Now, how do we deal with different clinical scenarios? First is angle recession glaucoma. As you all know, angle recession is only a pathological finding. Only about 7 to 9 percentage of angle recession patients is going to develop glaucoma that to several years after injury. So it is very important to annually follow up these patients if the angle recession is going to be more than 180 degrees. Regarding lens subluxation and dislocation, if the patient is going to have more than 25 percentage of the zonular rupture, then lens subluxation may be present. If the zonal rupture is going to be relatively severe, then the patient may manifest with either anterior or posterior dislocation of lens. And UBM can be used to assess the extent of zonal damage. If there is impending or established pupillary block, then laser iridotomy is very important. If the patient is having a dislocated or a subtotal subluxated lens, then we preferably do a cataract extraction either by anterior approach or by a parsplana approach. So this is a patient with lens particle glaucoma where you could see a clearly penetrating injury of the cornea with a corresponding iris wound and also this is a traumatic cataract with the ALC rupture with the spillover cortical matter in the anterior chamber. So this patient initially he was managed with steroids and cyclotrigics and glaucoma medications and subsequently he underwent a cataract extraction to control intraocular pressure. So we have to remember that if a patient is having a prolonged persistent inflammation after trauma, which is not at all getting control with steroids and cyclotrigics, then we may definitely we have to rule out a retained intraocular foreign body. And in patients with high femur, like almost 95 percentage of traumatic high femurs, they get settled with conservative management alone. Only 5 percentage of traumatic high femurs, they need an AC wash. So this AC wash is reserved for patients if the IOP is really going to be high of more than 50 mm mercury for more than 5 days or more than 45 mm mercury for more than 1 week or more than 35 mm mercury for more than 2 weeks. So go cell glaucoma, go cells are not, nothing but they are the khaki colored cells which are degenerated depigmented RBCs which is going to block the trabecular meshwork. So these patients may be treated either conservatively with medical management or AC wash and few patients may need vitrectomy and trabeculectomy also. And regarding orbital hemorrhage, so orbital hemorrhage, if the orbital hemorrhage is going to be very severe, it can lead to increase in intraorbital pressure as well as increase in intraocular pressure. So these patients may need a orbital decompression procedures like lateral canthotomy with or without inferior cantholysis if the IOP is going to be more than 40 mm mercury with an RAPD with the worsening visual acuity with the appreciation of uh, retinal arterial pulsations or intractable pain. So thank you. Thank you all for the patient listening. Uh, that was a nice presentation. Thank you, Dr. Vijayalakshmi. Now we'll move on to the next presentation by Dr. Pius, who will be talking to us on the post segment manifestation of uh, closed loop injury. Over to you, Dr. Pius. So patients with blunt trauma may look innocuous in the first look, but a careful and detailed history and fundus examination is necessary to rule out the collateral damage. So the first step is to rule out an occult uh, open globe injury. So on the left you see a patient who presented with a subconjunctival hemorrhage after trivial trauma. But what we see after dilatation, there is an interocular foreign body behind. So this is a case of open globe injury and not just a blunt trauma. So let us understand the mechanics of blunt trauma to the eyeball. So when a direct impact happens, the maximum damage is at the point where the blow is received. Then a compression wave goes and transmitted through the intraocular fluid in all directions leading to contra damage in the all uh, planes. Then the reflected compression wave comes and strikes the posterior pole leading to the damage at the posterior pole. And finally the rebound compression wave forces and strike uh, back anteriorly. 
So we all know about the seven rings of trauma, the iris sphincter, the iris base leading to aortic dialysis, anterior ciliary body leading to angle recession, ciliary body to the sc uh, scleral spur leading to cyclodialysis cleft, the trabecular meshwork leading to trabecular meshwork tears, zonules leading to lens subluxation and dislocation, and finally the retina to the aura, which leads to retinal dialysis and retinal detachment. So uh, what is the epidemiology? Rate of retinal involvement among eyes with closed lobe injury is 34%, whereas rate of vitreous involvement and retinal involvement in closed lobe injury is 22%. So we'll be discussing on the various manifestation. First is the vitreous hemorrhage. Vitreous hemorrhage will occur due to the damage of blood vessels of iris, ciliary body, retina, and choroid. It may uh, vary from a little hemorrhage to completely obstructing the vitreous cavity. So it may be associated with retinal breaks. It may be associated with Tursen syndrome. And incidence of Tursen syndrome in patients with subarachnoid hemorrhage can be 10 to 50%. So management, we have to screen the periphery for the presence of retinal breaks and the patient should be followed up till th to complete 360 degree of ORI is seen. In case it, uh, uh, retina is not seen, we have to perform serial B-scan ultrasonography to see and rule out the retinal detachment, optic nerve head avulsion, and vitreous incarceration. In case it's only a plain vitreous hemorrhage, we can observe for spontaneous resolution. But in some cases, we have to go for early vitrectomy. These will include the associated retinal detachment or a large retinal tear, non-resolving vitreous hemorrhage, ghost cell glaucoma, single-eyed patient, bilateral vitreous hemorrhage, or if it is associated with subretinal hemorrhage. Another one is the lens uh, dislocation, in which we'll have to go for PPV and PPL, and IUL can be put in this stage or maybe in the next stage. Then the vitreous base avulsion, there's a bucket handle sign that is a part of vitreous base is draped over the peripheral retina. The image I have borrowed from ASRS uh, retinal image bank. The symptoms may be minimal. Per se, vitreous base avulsion will not cause RD, but the clinician should be looking for retinal dialysis, giant retinal tears, and angle recession. And there is no intervention, just the patient has to uh, undergo a close follow-up uh, to look for the presence of other uh, pathologies. Then optic nerve uh, head avulsion. There's a rupture of optic nerve head avulsion at the disc uh, margin, maybe at the level of lamina cribrosa without damaging optic sheath. So the postulated mechanism will include direct trauma to the globe, sudden marked IOP rise, or the shearing forces from the acute uh, globe rotation. So it can be complete or it can be partial. So this is a case which we saw in optic nerve head avulsion. Uh, there's an excavation of optic nerve head area because of the retraction of optic nerve into its dural. Uh, B-scan and CT scan and MRI may not be very helpful. Uh, another complication can happen is the vascular occlusion. This is the same patient with optic nerve head avulsion and we can see a retinal artery occlusion here. And as we can also see, the ciliary retinal artery has not till now filled even till the, all the veins have been uh, filled up. Uh, another will be Berlin's edema. It is self-limited transient whitening at the level of deep sensor retina. So 9.4% of all the traumatic fundus uh, changes will include uh, Berlin's edema. It is a misnomer because there is no edema actually. There is a dis disruption of the photoreceptor outer segments. It may take hours to develop after the trauma. Posterior po if it involves the posterior pole, uh, we may see a cherry red spot at the fovea which may make the CRAO. Histopathological studies on animal models show that there has been disruption of photoreceptor outer segment. There is no proven treatment. It can be of two types, retinal concussion and retinal contusion. Retinal concussion is the milder version, whereas the retinal contusion is worse and can lead to permanent pigmented scars and incomplete visual recovery. So this is a case of uh, uh, Berlin's edema in the chronic follow-up where we see the scarring as happening. Macular hole. Trauma will account for around 10% of all the macular holes. PVD is usually absent in these cases. The macular hole tends to be more eccentric, less circular than the idiopathic macular hole as the horizontal diameter may be significantly longer than the vertical one. So this is a case of a macular hole uh, followed up for about two months. The patient did not consent for surgery. So there is no consensus on the management. Some say there can be a spontaneous closure, especially if the patient is young, if it's a small hole and does not have a vitreous cup. Late surgery lessens the chances of good anatomical and functional recovery. So this is a case that was operated by Dr. Naresh sir and uh, a good uh, visual, out, uh, visual outcome and anatomical outcome was seen. Then is the choroidal rupture. Rupture of uh, inner choroid, outer uh, Brooks membrane and RP. The fortified uh, collagenous uh, sclera and the flexible retina is less likely to rupture. So the incidence is around 5 to 10% of the blunt trauma. 
So it can be of two types, one is direct and one is indirect. Direct choroidal rupture is uncommon and usually parallel to the aura at the direct site of impact. And indirect choroidal rupture are more common, like here we see a choroidal rupture nasal to the optic disc. And majority of the them although occur temporal to the uh, disc and may involve the fovea. Like in this patient, it is a uh, crescent shape involving the fovea. And the indirect uh, choroidal ruptures, patient with brittle uh, Brooks membrane, especially in cases of enjoyed streaks are more susceptible and they are associated with intrachoroidal uh, subretinal and interretinal hemorrhages. So there's a long risk of long term risk of CNBM, especially if it is associated with old age, macular location and greater length of the anti uh, of the uh, choroidal rupture. Treatment is anti VEGF injections. So this is a choroidal rupture that uh, happened at the fovea itself. Multiple choroidal ruptures, some in the periphery and some uh, mostly temporal to the macula. So subretinal hemorrhage is another complication. There's a blood collection between the neurosensory retina and the RP. It is classified according to the size. Small subretinal hemorrhage will be less than 4 disc diameter. Medium will be more than uh, 4 disc diameter, but it does not extend beyond the temporal vascular arcades. And massive will overspread the temporal uh, vascular arcade. So uh, photoreceptor damage uh, can happen due to iron related toxicity, impairment of uh, diffusion of uh, oxygen and nutrients. So there are three treatment options. One is the pneumatic displacement. Second is the intravitreal uh, TPA injection with pneumatic displacement. And third is the subretinal injection of TPA along with pneumatic displacement. So this is a patient who presented three days after uh, uh, severe trauma with subretinal hemorrhage. Uh, we treated the patient with uh, intravitreal 0.3 ml 100% SF6 and uh, three months, uh, the subretinal hemorrhage dispersed from the fovea. So this is the final uh, OCT with a little bit of damage remaining. Then another uh, severe complication is chororetinitis scleropatera. It is the rupture of choroid, overlying Brooks membrane, RP, neurosensory retina, and happens secondary to a high velocity projectile which hits the globe but does not penetrate it. Uh, so this is a patient, 18 year old patient who received trauma while playing Gilly Randa what we see are two adjacent chororetinal tears anterior to the equator uh, in the inferior quadrant with thin strip of retina between them. So the teared up retina was seen uh, lying on the nasal part of the retina. And what happens in the uh, like long term follow up, it will completely get scarred. The management is controversial. Incidence of acute RD is low because of the scarring as well as the young patients. But late RD has been reported in one third of the patient and majority causes retinal breaks that happen at a different site. And visual prognosis will depend on the location of the scleropatera as well as status of the macular and optic nerve head. So retinal tears and RD can happen. Uh, what, uh, what the basic pathology is, vitreous based avulsion can lead to retinal dialysis as well as GRTs. Abnormal site of vitreoretinal adhesions can lead to hole. Coop uh, injury can lead to full thickness necrosis and sudden PVDs can release to HSTs. So this is a case of GRT that happened post trauma. The basic difference between a GRT and retinal dialysis as we all know, GRT is not supported by the vitreous so the retina tends to fall back on itself. And most common location of tears will be the inferior temporal quadrant because this is the most uh, less protected quadrant. And management in case of tears we can do for, go for it with laser or cryopexy. Retinal uh, detachment associated with dialysis we have to go for buckling and those associated with GRT we have to go for PPV. So always remember to record the baseline visual acuity for both the eyes, to document presence of or absence of RAPD, to examine the other eye for the presence of signs of trauma or other pre-existing diseases, and normal interior segment or vision should not deter the clinician from performing dilated fundus examination. Thank you. I acknowledge Dr. Krish, uh, Chitranjan Mishra for providing me the images. Uh, next I'll call uh, Dr. Mahesh sir for uh, evaluating the management of traumatic optic neuropathy. Good morning. First, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Piyush Kohli for uh, having uh, invited me here and given me the opportunity. So the topic for me is uh, uh, treatment of traumatic optic neuropathy. Slide show, please. Okay. So there, 
Yes. Uh, there are certain challenges in the treatment of traumatic optic neuropathy because there are no real evidence-based guidelines for the management of the same because there are no large natural history trials or randomized control trials because it's difficult to randomize these patients. The options suggested are surgical decompression, corticosteroids or simply observation. So uh, when we tr talk about the treatment, we talk about direct uh, traumatic optic neuropathy as well as indirect. A dra direct TOIN is a total globe rupture and obviously there is no treatment for this. And whenever there is an indirect uh, traumatic optic neuropathy, we have two types, anterior as well as posterior. Anterior meaning that it is in the, it could either be in the intraocular part of the optic nerve, which is the optic nerve head, or intraorbital part containing the central retinal artery, which is anterior to the entry of the central retinal artery. So in both these instances, there will be instantaneous visual loss. If it involves the intraocular optic nerve, like we have what we saw in uh, Dr. Piyush Kohli's presentation, there is an instant uh, optic nerve avulsion. And in the intraorbital part, anterior to the entry of central retinal artery, there may be a associated central retinal artery occlusion. In both these instances, the prognosis is poor. So what, by and large, whatever we talk is um, by in the majority are the uh, posterior indirect traumatic optic neuropathy, uh, which is posterior to the entry of the central retinal artery, uh, which occurs typically in an injury to the lateral third of the uh, eyebrow region here in this part in the temporal region. And whenever there is an injury which occurs here, it is transmitted directly to the optic canal, as we can see in this video. The force is transmitted to the optic canal and the optic nerve is uh, uh, confined within the tight uh, space of the intracanalicular part of the optic canal. So they, it leads to compartment syndrome, thereby leading to contusion. So the pathogenesis suggested are mechanical sharing, primary injury causing mechanical sharing of the optic nerve leading to uh, 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 retinal ganglion cell death and <coughs> ischemia due to contusion necrosis. And what we are aiming is to prevent the secondary injury caused by vasospasm and swelling of the optic nerve within the canal. So it is this part, secondary injury, which we can prevent uh, further damage and further vision loss. So here we can see a normal optic nerve and an edematous optic nerve. So uh, we propose steroids and the rationale for using steroids is it reduces the traumatic edema and limit the severity of the contusion necrosis of the optic nerve which happens at the secondary level and steroids may also reduce the degree of vasospasm that accompany the trauma. However, there is a word of caution here uh, for whoever is using steroids. We have to remember the crash study, the corticosteroid randomization after significant head trauma showed that there is a higher mortality with the use of intravenous high dose steroids. So whenever there is a severe head trauma and uh, whenever there is a CS of rhinorrhea, uh, we have to ask the history of all these things, CS of rhinorrhea, then we should try avoid steroids because it may do more harm than uh, good. So in summary, it was uh, proposed that IV methylprednisolone can be given 250 mg IV every six hours. Uh, for 24 to 48 hours if the patient presents within 8 hours of presentation. Alternately, it can be given 1 gram also IV uh, once a day. So in summary, management, confirm the clinical diagnosis. Uh, if yes, treat vision threatening and life threatening injuries. Perform the CT scan of the optic canal and uh, further treat with steroids. And uh, if it is improved, fine, taper the oral steroids. If not, consider optic canal decompression if there is a significant optic nerve contusion within the optic canal which may be picked up only by the MRI and then further uh, continue with the conservative management and uh, very rarely optic nerve canal decompression has to be considered. A newer novel treatment considered is an erythropoietin, intravenous erythropoietin uh, which is done by an uh, Iranian group and they have found in a pilot study and in a small study they have found that it has got a relatively equal um, a visual prognostic outcome as IV steroids or no treatment at all. So this may be considered alternative to steroids in cases where steroids are contraindicated. So in summary, um, failure to treat this will result in this optic atrophy and uh, early intervention is essential. Thank you for your kind attention. Next I'll invite Naresh sir for uh, his management of uh, intraocular foreign bodies. Uh, thank you, Dr. Piyush, for the invitation. 
and uh, so good morning the esteemed guests okay we are happy to have two guests here thanks for coming in spite of the busy schedule so i think i have got 10 minutes i'll try to run through yeah so there will be certain uh, repetition just don't mind because that is basically to reemphasize so we'll be discussing or just uh, sharing our experience of post segment trauma basically how to localize the foreign body and how to retrieve it i'll not be showing many videos because retrieval is not that difficult but uh, the work yeah ready yeah so open globe injury is not only the important cause of uh, uh, the blindness and the morbidity it is disfiguring also and uh, most importantly it has got a lot of uh, medical legal implication which has to be taken into account when we are dealing with the open globe injury so in any case uh, of open globe injury we have got three windows the first acute window within 24 hours the second one is one to one day to one month and the third window is after that yes so usually in acute window the basic purpose is to maintain the integrity to prevent the infection and in second two windows usually they come with the uh, sequelae usually in those two windows better you send the case to vr surgeons and uh, before we start the ex ocular examination see always not uh, eye injuries uh, what you call uh, isolated sometimes it can be a part of a road traffic accident or a blast injury so do all these things meticulously look for the systemic stability because life is more important than the eyes and then you go for the rest of the things and usually any case of open globe injury we usually take under open i mean general anesthesia irrespective of the age because it is very difficult to assess the time so never uh, go for local anesthesia in these cases and uh, when you come across the injury these are the questions to be raised because this will uh, give a lot of a uh, clue for what so this uh, was already told by uh, what you call uh, uh, piush we thought this could be a closed globe injury but when you examine so this is what we found there was a foreign body inside and localizing the foreign body very precisely is very important to retrieve okay this i will just uh, but you have to prognosticate before you take the case because uh, in our practice we always come across after explaining all the poor prognosis the patient certain will ask where ono li it means is, is there anything more actually or nothing else is there so ima imaging is very important the first most important imaging is i'll just skip that yeah first Im important imaging is the x rays so should we do prophylactic uh, antibiotics yes it has got a role uh maybe controversial but still we give but if the patient comes with no pl don't say no to the surgery because no pl is not a contraindication for surgery in case of uh, what you call the open globe injury because many people have uh, got good vision after surgeries okay so intravital antibiotic yes at the end of every procedure we have to give vancocept and uh, uh, sometimes voriconazole depending upon the thing so what all the indications usually in uh, open globe injury whenever there is a foreign body before taking the case you just go for a good counseling especially in groups so that you involve every other member of the family and you have to tell about the need for the multiple surgery and we have to be very brutal and frank about the prognosis and the chances of thysis has to be explained and one more thing is the sympathetic ophthalmia of the fellow eye so these are all there in the book we can just skip actually but localizing the foreign body is very important so how to localize the history is also important actually this patient came with uh, multiple pins actually actually this was a self inflicted injury we could see only three but on x ray so this was the previous x ray 3 months ago when before he came to us when he came to us we saw more than 60 70 pins actually and this was a reconstructed picture of the what do you call the 3d picture of his uh, ct showing multiple pins this was because of the depression he was uh, putting the needle inside his eye so we could not uh, do much in this patient okay so how to localize the best way is to do indirect ophthalmoscopy before the media becomes hazy but x ray is always important pa view is the one which is recommended because in ap view we will have lot of bony shadow and for medical legal purpose you do this in case if you don't have any ct scan you can go for a limbal ring in this you can construct the artificial eye so that you can uh, find whether it's intraocular or extraocular this is one such case so we have done the limbal ring actually if you see it is in the lateral picture it's not there in the ring but the foreign body was much behind when ct was done it was in the frontal lobe of the brain actually so nothing could be done the advantage of ultrasound is you can find the collateral damage like vitreous hemorrhage or uh, any retinal tear or 
any retinal detachment, choroidal detachment, and the lens capsule status. But do it gently, do not press so that the contents might come out if you are uh, uh, very this thing actually. Uh, why the localization is important in this case, we thought it is just a vitreous corn bud in the vitreous after doing the ultrasound. Sometimes it is deceiving. After doing a vitrectomy, there was exit wound, but uh, we have been searching for the foreign body, nothing could be seen. So the best way is you do a fluid air exchange. Sometimes in case of chronic foreign body, you can find the foreign body in the fast plan area so that it's identifying that is easy. But in this, uh, the entire retina was searched, nothing could be found. So the localization was bad in this case, but somehow I was lucky, like we just, just went and bridled. And with the magnet, when I was uh, fishing out through the sclera, it was on the sclera, it has uh, penetrated through the sclera and it has come out. So this is a rare earth magnet which I uh, will be showing actually which uh, can pick any of the metallic foreign body, not only the iron, it can pick even the nickel and other, the other uh, uh, what do you call the foreign bodies. It has got a, a changeable tip right from, okay, so the right hand, the one is the magnet actually. So I was fishing out, I could feel that the foreign body came out, okay. So sometimes if you do not precisely localize, we will end up in all this problem. And the other thing is a CT scan. It is very useful in uh, localizing even the, if the foreign body is very, very small. But when you are doing MRI, uh, be careful uh, to rule out a, a metallic foreign body because it might move inside the eye and will lead to collateral damage when you are doing the MRI. And ERG is very useful in case of a chronic foreign bodies. Right? If the ERG is uh, flat, still you do an EOG, only in the presence of flat ERG and a flat EOG, retrieving the foreign body is of no use. But if the flat ERG is flat, but if the EOG is of normal, still go ahead, the patient will get a good vision. Okay? So basically the management ob objective as I have already discussed is to establish the integrity, prevent the infection, then remove the foreign body, maintain the clear media, manage and finally ROP. And the most important is preventing the sympathetic ophthalmia. And all reactive foreign body, whether it's iron or nickel, I mean, sorry, copper, everything should be removed. But if it is a glass foreign body or rock piece, usually I tend to leave it because they are inert. And more important, because it's irregular, it's difficult to retrieve if it is large, if you don't have the proper armamentarium. There are various routes, but now we do. So this is uh, uh, the basic thing uh, which I have taken from the dictionary. So without a proper armamentarium, never enter the eye in case of foreign body, okay? So these are the various foreign body which can be retrieved by various uh, instruments. Not everything can be done by the same instrument, so you should have every other armamentarium when you are going inside. So I think uh, the videos, okay. So for example, this is a case of history of injury with the thorn. When you inside after doing the vitrectomy, Yeah, you can find the thorn protruding inside the eye. So in these cases, you cannot retrieve this foreign body through the sclera. So you have to sacrifice the lens and it has to be removed trans uh, sclerally through the, what you call uh, the corner, uh, corner scleral wound. So usually we make a second opening to send the for forceps inside. Yeah, we pull the, what you call the thorn and it is retrieved through the pupil trans. I mean, uh, through the pupillary path. It cannot be re removed through the, uh, what you call the scleral pathway, but you have to remove the rest of the remnants. And uh, this is a case, we get all funny foreign bodies. This is a case, again, a large foreign body inserted over the optic disc like a tower, actually, you can find out. Again, this cannot be retrieved through the uh, sclera. So you have to sacrifice the lens, we have no other option, but with uh, all these SFIL techniques, sacrificing the lens is not that traumatic nowadays. So you just go inside, you can find with the right instrument. Yeah, this is the foreign body, which was there on the disc, but uh, there was no visual prognosis. At least the complication due to metallosis can be prevented. So this is a very large foreign body over the disc. Again, in these cases, transcleral is not advisable or not possible also. So you just go for what you call the trans uh, pupillary delivery of the foreign body. Okay. So as I have uh, told, in case of chronic foreign bodies, the patient will come with metallosis. In this case, I couldn't uh, localize the foreign body in spite of the CT showing. So you go for a fluid erection because that gives a panoramic view. So when we are doing the depression, I could see 
see the foreign body in the inferior pars plana area. Usually, uh, MVR is used to tease the foreign body from the sclera. And yes, you can see the foreign body, it is teased. And as I have told, sometimes it's very difficult to localize. So you go for the third port. People do so many ways, actually. You can uh, go through the same port also. Then you can go for the separate port for the vitrectomy cutter. But here we go for a separate port. And using the, after localizing, yeah, yeah. Using the forceps, you can just go and retrieve it, yes. So I'll just conclude in a minute. So these are the uh, uh, rare earth magnet, the forceps, and the most important thing is the most powerful electromagnet, which is there working as yet for more than 40, 45 years. It's quite uh, uh, useful in retrieving the foreign body, especially from the sclera when it is struck, actually. So these cases I'll just remove. So basically the prognosis depends on the site of the foreign body and the damage to the macula. If everything is fine, good. And irrespective of the foreign body, if it is metallic and uh, if it can cause metallosis, you have to remove it. Non-magnetic foreign body usually entails a very bad prognosis because retrieving that is very difficult. And we don't have the proper uh, forceps also to remove that. We use Bapai's forceps, okay? So, and uh, usually if there is uh, any previous uh, operations, it makes the prognosis even worse. Lens damage also worsens the prognosis due to poor visibility and lens-induced complication. But anyhow, preventing the sympathetic ophthalmia is very, very important. And with that, I would like to conclude this. Thank you very much. Any yeah. Aspects of, uh, what is the medical legal aspect of uh, operating or not operating a case with no PL vision uh, following trauma? No, we can, uh, if you don't operate, it's not a problem. If you operate, also not a problem. But uh, as I was telling, counsel them. Okay. Counsel completely, take a video consent. Don't take the consent on the day of surgery, at least one day before, if it is not an emergency. Okay. Because under uh, this thing, they will give the consent on the day of surgery, and next day they will say that we have uh, done something wrong. And sir, if there is a case of like intraocular impacted foreign body in the say sclera and we have an open globe injury, uh, what is the like, do you, would you like to go for like both the surgeries together or can we have a gap of one or two days? Uh, gap is not a problem. If you retrieve the foreign body, okay. then we can go for the surgery inside the eye later on also. Okay. okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Yeah. Sir, re regarding that iris reposition after corneal injury, uh, you are telling 48 hours. Yeah. But any any iris prolapse is dirty, open for 48 hours. <coughs> is it safe? No. So it depends on the morphology of the iris tissue. Yes. So usually <coughs> if it is uh, glossy, yes. uh, it is clear and without any foreign body or debris over the uh, iris tissue, prolapse iris tissue, uh, then you can repose it. Sometimes the, the time of presentation is so late, yes. or even if it is 24 hours also, within 24 hours also, mm -hmm. the nature of injury uh, is so bad that it will be, iris will be full you know, of membranes over it. Uh, and it will like, no, it is like a, mm -hmm. um, like a little bit of atrophic yes. uh, type of this thing. And the surrounding wound edges as look is more important. If you have a wound edges which is clear cut without uh, any infiltrate surrounding the in, uh, iris, then you can jolly will put it inside. Or anything uh, structurally, if you think the glossiness is gone, uh, then you better cut it out. Okay. Remove it and then put the then, suture. Then, sir, uh, regarding the lens, like uh, lenticular injury, yeah. uh, in the primary closure of the globe, should we remove the lens if there is injury to the lens capsule? Because I have done this mistake. One, Blast injury, I when I was long back, when I saw lens capsule also coming out, why not clean everything? I cleaned the lens capsule. And patient subsequently develops uh, endophthalmitis. And later I studied the things they have written, okay. don't touch the posterior segment during initial repairment of the glue. I don't know, sir, how much I am correct. No, no. usually what yeah. I do yeah. is that if the anterior capsule is only bridge yes. uh, and there is no spillover of lens matter in the AC, uh, yeah. We 
first initially treat uh, only the corneal tear repair. If you see the case what Dr. Madhusekar sold, there are two different types of the case. Uh, you saw that spillover multiple of lens matter inside the AC full. In that case, you please remove the lens. But don't put the IOL. I am not talking about lens removal. I am talking about the lens surgery replacement. You lens remove the cartilage lens and you don't uh, do the IOL at the same time. It's not a crime. But you okay. put this lens, IOL in the same time, yeah. it might be in the, it may land up in this late post of early post of end of. Because you have not fully um, given this intra, uh, intraocular antibiotics and all. I think Madhu, if you want to have a change in this. Uh, yes, sir. Correctly, you told, sir, like uh, IOL placement in this type of cases we can postpone because sometimes uh, it can cause uh, uh, that uh, lens induced uveitis or task like picture. So we can delay the placement of IOL. We can do it as secondary procedure. patient with blunt trauma and on the day of trauma patient vomited twice because of I think glaucoma and then on the next day patient was all right should I worried more about this case no no didn't record after reaching home patient called me and told he vomited mm. twice it could be due to increase in intraocular pressure. Yes. So only if IOP is recorded, we can decide on the treatment, whether the patient need a, whether topical glaucoma medications alone or whether we need to add a systemic aqueous suppressants also. Okay, but next so day when the patient came, yeah. it was normal. IOP was normal. normal. Uh, then it at towards the lower range. Okay, mm -hmm. okay. Then we cannot, uh, because uh, usually the initial period, the rise in intraocular pressure following blunt injury, it could be due to the inflammation. Yes. So it will take some time for it to subside. It will take some at least uh, one week to two weeks to subside. So it will okay. not get back to normal within a day. Probably the reason could be some other factor. Okay, thank uh, you, ma'am. I think we'll have to conclude the session. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.